All right, without further ado, uh, the man, the 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 cult hero, the man who talked turned himself into a cult hero, and whether it was self proclaimed, whether it was led by the people, we'll never know. But this man and I were drafted very close together at the West Coast Eagles. His career started there just before mine, and he finished a premier in Hawthorne. We are joined by none other than Matthew Spanger. Hi, mate. Hey, gents. Thanks very much for having me on. Uh, look, um, I don't know how this is still going, but you would have been a big fan of back chat um, when you were when when you were when you were still playing at West Coast. I think I started back chat up. I think Kyle Morton and I were doing it in the um, in the garage there with an the iPhone in the middle of us. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Although I must admit, I was a bit of a late adopter when it comes to back chat, mainly because um, I just waited till Butsy got on the on the podcast. Oh, don't no, tell him that. Don't, but, do um, that. don't kill me like that. But uh, but it was a, it was a nice form of nostalgia. Really, it was like uh, given we're separated by you know a country length, that um, it was a nice way for me to feel like I was back in the locker room a little bit back right. with you boys when you were doing that. So how I usually start with guests uh, at the moment, Spain, it's with the same question. Um, now, I actually don't know where you're going to take this one, um, but we will get into a bit of your career. I think you've got an amazing footy story, and I'm actually pretty excited to interview you properly about it. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. But the first question we ask our guests is, you need to name your greatest sporting achievement not on the footy field. So, yeah, okay, you've won a premiership with Hawthorne. Good on you. No one cares. That don't impress me much. Yeah. We, we, we want to know your greatest sporting achievement, not in your sport of choice. Go. Yeah, it'd be uh, – well, the two that immediately come to mind is uh, I like to think I was a good – I was better at athletics when I was a junior than um, – and so, like, my long distance was okay and I once – competed at the nationals so which is like absolutely pox but the one that was yeah. okay probably more impressive personally was and the cricket ball actually reminded me of it, that's why i was asking is i bowled a hat trick in the year eight reds which is like <laughs> below the number rankings to give you a category of how bad i was at cricket um but to know that i could at least dominate that level with a with a hat trick you know and I mean, how many people have got to bowl a legitimate hat trick in a legitimate game? But I mean, I suppose legitimate game is too strong a term, really. Like it's those everyone gets two overs bowling and two overs batting kind of formats. But hey, look, I was happy with it. So hat, I, hat um, trick. That's about yeah. as, as hat, successful as I got. Not in bad. Cricket field. Was it in a regular season game or a final? Uh, no, nah, regular season. It was in a. Um, Scoe is familiar with the APS school system over here. It was for Xavier. Xavier College. Right. So this cricket ball that you've that you've obviously as soon as you got on the call, that was probably one of the first things you you talk, you asked us about was this cricket ball. So this is my cricket mm-hmm. trophy. It's um and people on the podcast might not know about this, but um Oh, they'll know <laughs> literally anyone who's ever listened used to talk about this. Um Chuit Hill Cricket Club, which is one of the premier cricket clubs in Perth. Um under 12's best performance in a final, which is this which is what that ball is from, that actual game, five wickets for uh, 16 runs in a final. Um, I did actually, I was on a hat-trick ball as well, um, but then that was the end of the game. I bowled them all out. So um, <laughs> I couldn't quite get the hat-trick, <laughs> but I did end up with Pfeiffer um, in, in a final, which we lost. Well, that is super impressive, but how flat were you <laughs> about not being able to bowl the hat-trick or get the, at least the attempt at the hat-trick? Yeah, look, I um, I thought about it all off-season, practiced real hard, and then bowled a uh, no-ball off the pitch, first ball of the game um, the next time I played. <laughs> so it did ruin the, the hat-trick That's... ball for me, but that I don't know if the, the hat-trick beats my 5 for 16. I think it certainly does, to be honest. I mean, the fact that it was in year 8 Reds, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming there would have been at Xavier College, uh, if you don't know, Dan's a very big school. It goes, it will be A's, B's, C's, be like, C twos, yep. DAs, Diamonds. yeah, yeah. There, there'd be a lot of teams before it gets to red. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so the fact that he's done it in that sort of level of cricket, which is very poor, <laughs> I think it's got to. I think it's got to go close to beat it. All right, we'll need a whiteboard with it's, everyone's it's guess. It yeah, it's about as it gets, mate. Um, look, I want to get into your career a little bit. Um, for those listening that don't know Matt Spanger, he was a draft pick in the 30s somewhere, 34. 34, that's right. 34, I believe, um, which is pretty pretty high for what sort of player you spat out as. And, and none of this is meant as disrespect, 
but you're a battler. You you're, you ended up being a battler just like me. <laughs> we were battlers. And, and, and as long as you accept that, that's okay. But I wanted to ask, you know, you, you came to West Coast. You were drafted there from Melbourne, um, a Victorian boy. You came into a team that played in two grand finals in two years, 2005, 2006. What sort of... Uh, what sort of input did you have into those teams, and what, what? What? Tell me some stuff about that time of your AFL career. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, firstly, thanks for the, the battle <laughs> tag, but you're right, absolutely. Um, I came to terms long ago with what my football prowess actually was in terms of the output, so more than comfortable with that. And in terms of uh, and one one I suppose edit to your intro there, Scoey. I actually arrived at the end of 05, so I wasn't part of the 05 uh. campaign where they lost, but um, certainly arrived off the back of that loss. Um, and I suppose when you don't have any basis comparison, but looking back on a career and then being lucky enough to be part of other premiership sides and the campaigns that they had and then even arriving at other clubs off the back of losing a grand final. It was interesting to see the mentality of the playing group um, back then. I know you had Butsy on last week speaking a little bit about the group back then as well. But um, I mean, first impressions, mate, I was a, you know, a very, like we all are when we get drafted, mostly like a young, many ways naive young man, just wanted to put my best foot forward. But um and to answer your question about input in terms of those campaigns, like all that campaign, it was as minimal as it gets. I suppose my first three months was uh, was going okay and then uh, suffered a, an injury or was succumbed to an injury called osteitis pubis, which was more fashionable back then than it is now. I think it's more about load management um, that they find that sports science finally caught up with uh, the rigours of professional football in that respect. And <laughs> Fortunately, the athletes these days aren't, aren't suffering from that as much. But um, yeah, then I was basically, I went in for surgery, which again, to show you sort of the, how much footy changes, like I, you speak to any medical professional, they say that surgery is the absolute last thing you do for osteotis pubis these days. But it was just like a common place back then. And I effectively missed the whole year. So um, my contribution would have been at maximum banter in the locker room for that premiership. Um, but what was good about it was uh, was just the fact that you, I mean, as I said, like when you're 18, you're just a bit of a sponge and you're trying to absorb as much as you can. So to be around that um, from a football sense was was really good in in many respects. And then um, and look, you know, like that team, you know, as you know, Scully, like we went through some challenges at the back end of or the back end of those years when a lot of those guys were around and. Um, but you learn a lot from that as well. So um, for me initially, mate, it was uh, a little bit of a passenger ride, but it's probably one that set me up for certainly later in the career. I remember you talking to me when I first got to the club. So you were there 12 months before I was and you spent a lot of that year injured. But I remember you telling me some pre-season sessions you used to, you used to be a good runner. Um, you probably still are really, but you, you used to do pre-season sessions with some of the midfielders and specifically with Juddy. I remember you telling me something about 200s or 400s. Do you know the sessions I'm talking to you about? Because we spoke to Sam Butler about it and he, he classified that midfield group as the hardest group of footballers he's ever come across in his time in the game. And and we'll get into more of your journey in a little bit. But does that ring true? And, and tell me about those sessions you used to do with some of those midfielders. Yeah, I um, yeah, there's a school out in Scarborough, which I, I can't recall anymore, but we used to do a lot of our preseason sessions there on like their grass, Ath track. Um, St. Mary's and yeah thank you and um, and I remember uh, I, and I sort of alluded to the athletics background before so I kind of loved those repeat speed sessions of like eights fours and twos maybe just because a little bit crazy but enjoyed the running and um, and Juddy had a bit of that in him as well and there was almost like an, an overriding philosophy like if um if you broke Juddy, like you'd like the rest of the group was absolutely cooked. Like Juddy would never be the one to break. And then I remember like one of the my sessions, Wusha though it's Wusha was famous for his last session before the Christmas break of just flogging us to death. <laughs> and um and so it's basically everyone always knew that there was something coming that wasn't prescribed in like the team meeting about what the training session was, basically. And uh, but you just didn't know what it was, and it could have been anything. A lot of the time, it was Jacob's ladder in the hills, or it was on one occasion it was a beep test, I think. And then um, <laughs> you know, some occasions it's been 
uh, like a, a swim session down at Scarborough or something. But it was, and this particular occasion, it was the session we did, um, which was, I think it was like two 1K, no, sorry, 1K, two eights, four fours, all like on six, eight, uh, sorry, six, four and two minutes respectively. And then, which is tough. And then, uh, then he was like, right, do it again. And, um, <laughs> and like Juddy, like we got through the, the one K and I think we got through the eights and then like if people were just dropping off and like, it was just ridiculous. And then Juddy broke in one of the fours and, um, and Wush just like blew the whistle. It was like, right, I got him. Like, and that was kind of the session. It was like, everyone just go home. And he was supposed to have like a big send off like Christmas party, but everyone just like lied on the ground for like 30 minutes after. And I, I was in my mind, I was like, that is like intense training. You know, that's, um, it's probably still one of the hardest sessions. Like, I certainly can't remember that level of detail in almost any other footy session I did. So it obviously stuck in my <laughs> mind to some degree. Um, but I honestly loved it. And, um, and I, I love, maybe this is more reflective of either my injury status for most of my career or maybe my football capacity. But I actually really enjoyed preseason because of the fact that everyone was quite unified. Like, once the season starts, it can sometimes get a little bit tricky when players aren't playing games and things like that. Whereas the preseason, everyone's in a happy mood. It's a fresh start. You know, there's hope if you hadn't played a game and all that sort of stuff. So even though you're doing it tough, to, you're doing it tough together. So I always enjoyed that period. Plus, I loved training with my mates. So that was, um, it was nice to go through that together, even so though it was bloody tough. You played um, 56 games over, is it 13 or 14 years? It's 13 years? Mm-mm. No one knew that. 11 years, mate. Oh, there you go. Um, 56 games over 11 years, three clubs. Um, you speak about loving pre-season. Um, once you got to the real stuff, to the to the games, can you reflect on, I guess, your whole career uh, across all three clubs as to why it was only 56 games? Could you pinpoint a reason? Oh, in part, um, probably different reasons at different clubs, to be fair. I think, well, initially I didn't play a game my first two seasons. And I mean, most uh, the short answer is injuries is a lot of the reason. And then injuries doesn't breed continuity, really. Um, so for me, like initially, yeah, I didn't play any games in the first two years. Um, I didn't play a game in terms of even like waffle footy or anything in my first year. And then the second year, um, four games into the season, the waffle season, I did my shoulder. Um, and then... Uh, the club decided to put me in for surgery halfway through that season and fortunately give me another contract, but that was sort of, it just meant that there was no games that year and the plan was to come back and then um, have a crack in the third season. So for that, um, which was probably at the time a good decision really, um, given that we had at the time pretty strong key defenders and were going well, it would have been unrealistic for me to probably break into that side anyway. Like, so um but uh, having said that, Scully, you did, and you were pretty ordinary back then. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? But um, no, but honestly, and then like, and then as it sort of played out, and sort of the nature of of that, and now having worked in the footy landscape, there are a lot more conversations behind behind the the scenes of, away from the track about players' durability that are important. That I, I probably wasn't aware of and then um you know the year after i got there you arrived scully eric mckenzie arrived and i have no issues and so mitch brown as well and i have no issues in <laughs> suggesting that all three of you were much better key defenders than i was so um so in terms of west coast it probably came down to more around not being able to get on there early enough the track early enough and then guys just probably went past me in that respect and um I wasn't the most elite kick. Certainly, I don't pretend that I was. But um, at West Coast, once you sort of get pigeonholed there as well, I got pigeonholed a little bit in terms of that. And we weren't going well. And you could just tell what like, time was up there. Whereas the fresh start at Sydney actually was, was probably the, the most well-received I felt by the coaches and the playing group, even though I only played six games there. Um, it was... Uh, the only reason I didn't play there was purely because of injuries. I um, I missed the first preseason. I tore my quad uh, and missed 19 weeks with a torn quad. Um, Decent quaddy. And then finally came back in the last uh, and played played the last uh, effectively the last six games of the year, including the finals. And then came into preseason and was 
um, rare in a guard. It was pretty much, you know, my spot playing as a forward actually at Swans and, um, and then had another really bad hamstring injury, another like 16 week hamstring injury, and then just kept re-tearing it that season. So, uh, and then at the Hawks, I arrived at a good, I actually moved to the Hawks knowing that I was coming as a, effectively a backup player. That was the conversation. Um, but I was, I could understand that I was probably that anyway at the Swans and, Hawthorne offered me more time in the game, which is what I thought I needed at the time. And then um, the way things fell in 2014, there was a retiring of Brent Guerra in 20, at the end of 2013 and a spot was opened up in the back line and it, and it all worked well. And then um, and then 2015, again, I, after 2014, basically just another shocking run of injuries. So, um, which, you know, and not injuries that were ever season ending, but those ones where it'd be hamstrings that were often like, four weeks here, come back, tear it again, come back, tear a calf. Like there was just no opportunity. And then, yeah. And funnily enough, thought that you have real conversations at that stage of your career and the coach is just like, we just can't rely on you being on the pitch. Like it's, and my final game just sort of to, to really earmark that was three minutes played at the Gabba. I told him having again at the end. So, um, yeah. And you tried to run it out. Kind of, You're on the sideline trying yeah. to run out a hammy, mate. I remember that. Yeah. Well, it was, um, like you've done hammies, Scully, I think from memory, but but it was um like this one was uh, was was more tendon than it was than the belly of the muscle. So like it it wasn't like that debilitating while it was warm, and then once it cooled down, it was uh, I couldn't really move. So that was kind of kind of why. Maybe that was just my mental capacity trying to convince myself nothing was wrong, but it was uh, yeah, it wasn't wasn't as good. And that was that was effectively it, mate. That was that was the career over after that. When you um you talked about going uh, forward, <clears throat> excuse me, at, at Sydney, I was just having a look at your goals sort of spread over your career. So three at West Coast, two at Hawthorne, but but eight in, at Sydney, and that was only over six goals. So, what was the change there that you were were you just in front of goals a bit more often? Obviously, moving forward, but were you just a straighter kick for those six games? Well, honestly, it was more. Um, I don't. I didn't play a single game at the Swans as a defender. Um, so I. Uh, I was I recruited there as a defender initially, and then um, the NEFL competition, as it was back then, wasn't overly strong. And um, the Swans reserves often often played pretty well against some teams. And we played a game, I believe it was Sydney Uni in their first year in the NEFL, like 2011. I could be wrong on that, but I think it was where we uh, we played them uh, as a curtain raiser at the SDG. And after the first quarter, it was like 60 points to nil, and they hadn't had an inside 50 um and <laughs> basically the coach at the time was Jared Crouch. He just said, like, boys, swap ends. Like, like I was kicking sort of rules. <laughs> like, forwards become defenders, defenders come forwards, just to get some people into the game. And um, I ended up kicking six for that for that game. But I think, like, you know, Jared, I think Jared Moore kicked 10 or something like that. Like, it was a bit <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but uh, but then they were like, oh, well, like, they were pleased with, like, the patterns and all that sort of stuff, the way it worked. And... Um, and then, yeah, and then the next week played again, just played forward a, a more competitive game, kicked, kicked, sorry, kicked another few goals and, um, and then, yeah, and then it just a spot opened up in terms of the forward line and what they were after. Like Jesse White was injured and Lewis Roberts Thompson was, was coming back from injury as well. So, um, just a spot opened up really. That's all that came down to in terms of, in terms of hitting the scoreboard there. And then at the Hawks, yeah, I mean, I, I played a couple of games forward, but mainly as a defender again. Um, I want to. Are you go on? Yeah, I was, gonna, I was just going to ask. Like, getting injured is pretty rubbish, and it seemed to happen quite a bit. What what kept you? What kept you going? Thinking, all right, I'm going to rehab this, get back on. Like, you know, a lot of people probably would have thought, nah, my body just can't handle this, and and probably thrown in the towel earlier. I mean, playing for eleven seasons is quite a quite a long time to then go through that many injuries. What was it for you that kept you just going? Yep, I'm coming back. Oh, short answer, you know, for the love of the game. Like I always wanted to play as much as I could. And um, I was probably lucky early days. I had some really good mentors in the rehab space that probably showed me a little bit about what the attitude looks like and how, and that you can still enjoy elements of that and make grounds in those times, even though it's a little bit, uh, or certainly debilitating can be on at times lonely and things like that. But um Certainly Brad Smith, who I know, I think still involved with the, with the Eagles, um, was unreal for me 
early days. Like he was someone um, who worked really hard. And then Damien Atkins as well were two that sort of came to mind. And then Travis Gasper, if I'm talking about old school Eagles names. And then, um, I, yeah, it's it's one of those things. I've, like, I've, I've really always enjoyed the work and I like enjoyed that feeling of working and like stretching myself. So that's probably like you give yourself little challenges. But um, deep down as well, I probably always thought I was good enough to contribute once I was fit. Um, I just needed to get out there. And so uh, that was always a driving factor. And I was also lucky to always be at successful teams and you just want to be out there and be part of it. And that was enough of a motivation really. All right. So talk to me about what made these teams good because you played in the era with West Coast, uh, like I said, that came off the back of losing grand final. Um, You were drafted. They won a grand final in 2006. Um, You then played a few more seasons. You moved to Sydney who were a part of a, winning grand final while you were in the squad and then Hawthorne you were there through their three-peat 13, 14, 15 so breaking each one down what what made West Coast good? Short answer West Coast was uh, was the cattle um, they and Butsy alluded to it last week and I still sort of when I still think back at the names that were in that midfield and the reference them it was it's hard to sort of think about a midfield that was as dominant one-on-one as those guys were. Um, but I suppose, uh, you know, for me, I, the what I, and it was sort of fast forwarding a little bit, but I mean, the difference, I suppose, between that time and then um, my time at the, Haw- at the Hawks was the mentality of sustained success. So there was a little, like there's a bit of a shift where I think, Certainly when I entered the system, like winning a premiership was, it was almost enough. And um, there almost wasn't even a, it wasn't a great thought on like going back to back. Like it wasn't really discussed. Like, you know, you know, seven, when you arrived, Scully, I don't know if you recall, like whether that like being the, being the chat, like it wasn't, I don't really recall that being a prominent, like, yeah, let's go back to back. Like we'd probably just, um, the guys that obviously just lost 05, probably a little bit of relief and in many ways redemption in, in 06 and then some significant dramas in the off season of 06 and 07 that probably just guys were just happy to be back and playing footy and not thinking too much about the drive but the the actual work rate of those guys in that season of 06 was was really noticeable and um i think football training programs probably were a little bit different back then like in a, i still probably had a hint of the old school and um and guys that were even at the end of their careers in that time, like Drew Banfield, you know, comes through in the nineties, like where he has got like a full-time job, basically when he first starts playing, um, it was really interesting to have those guys as, as mentality, as their mentalities. And, um, and like Dave Wilpinder also comes to mind in that sort of echelon and then translate that into the new sort of crop coming through who were effectively like first time professional footballers. So, it was really interesting to see that, but the work rate for those guys was what shone through. Sydney was um, was interesting. It was, uh, I don't think it's ever one thing, by the way, for all these things, but if we're trying to point, point out differences, like Sydney had a really, I don't know, like you'll hate this guy, like the, the Bloods. The Bloods. The culture, the tagline. The Bloods. Yeah, but, um, but it wasn't... Um, it was less about like what like that word the bloods and it was more just about like a bit of a, like a brotherhood because you you don't you are there by yourselves effectively and you didn't really know anyone like no other than Kieran Jack I don't think anyone was really from Sydney or maybe like LRT but like so everyone sort of comes there and you need to to really bond one another like that's sort of a nice organic symptom of playing for the Swans and I guess the Giants these days um, but uh, but for me and then the the Hawks was probably the place I was paying the most attention to all that stuff. And uh, and for me, other than the what I thought was the players there, they obviously had some pretty quality players themselves who I dare say most all, or there'll probably be five or six Hall of Famers who might sneak through from that, that era. But it was also, um, I had the clearest understanding of what my role was on any given day when I got to the Hawks versus the other teams. Um, and even more to that, I actually knew what other people's role was. Now that was probably more reflective of where my football maturity was by the time I got to the Hawks, but it was really instilled in everyone to be 
more aware of your own space. And um, that was a big part of the versatility message that Clarko would push, but also the fact that communication was such a high priority and that was actually measured and KPIs were based on that as best they could and things like that, which I think made that team a little bit more successful than others. And I've just felt sort of privileged to be a part of that, to be honest. What about uh, each coach? So you've played under three premiership coaches. Uh, more, if I've uh, have you played the, with more, or is three correct? Uh, no, just just the three. Yeah, just the three. So That's more than most. I shouldn't say just the three. Yeah, Worsfold, <laughs> Longmire, Clarkson. Um, from afar, they seem quite different. Are they? And. Again, what what makes them good coaches? Because I'm sure they all have weaknesses. I'm sure they have differences that sets them apart, and everyone does. But what are their strengths? What makes them good at what they do? Because they've coached a team to a premiership. Yeah, I think, um, well, chronologically, I think Wusher, when he was uh, like in 05 and 06, when I got there, footy was still that one-on-one brand. And I... I I mean, I was young, but I recall watching Wusher play and then, you know, he certainly brought a lot of that mentality into the way we trained and the way we played. Um, and then when we had those players that I referenced earlier, like it's if you sort of combine that talent with that work rate and then that rough, men- or sorry, that tough mentality, it's a good combination. That's something he instilled, certainly. Um, I thought that was, you know, that was a, a good positive of his, I suppose. Um, you know, Wush, I, pro- I probably didn't. Ad- well, I th- that's just my opinion, of course. I don't think we adapted as a team enough to the new style of footy um, as we were going down. I know we lost a lot of players as well, which didn't help. But I think we were sl- we were we were slow to react to certainly like a zone defence and a team team defence ethic um, at the Eagles initially, and then uh, at the at the Swans. Horse, uh, look, I horse is John. I, I really love horse. Anyone, anyone listening, yeah, John? So, yeah, I, horse. Really, um, I, I absolutely loved playing for horse. Like he, um, he was the kindest person you'd ever meet off the field, and so genuine. And like, he's he's got like a real baritone, deep voice, but like, <laughs> he's real nurturing with it. And then. Like game day gets while on fever, like you wouldn't believe in from a coaching point of view. And there was almost a, you don't want to let that person down. And then you mix that with almost fear of just like, <laughs> oh my god, what is happening on game day? That that he got the he got the best out of. Well, certainly got the best out of me in those respects. The games that I played, and then so, so, sorry, um, to, sorry to butt in. Did did they have or all have an element of fear? Because like I was always scared of Wusher, and I know you were too. You just said you've you know, relatively scared of of horse on game day only, and Clarkson he he looks like the, honestly he looks like the scariest of the lot. He he looks like the, the you know the the silent assassin like who will, will kill you. Uh, was there an element of fear? Because is that right? Yeah, there would there would have to be. I think the percentage drops off as you get older. I think when you just realise they are just people, but <laughs> certainly there's, um, and Clarko's got some great ones. You're right. Like I think if you're talking stories of, um, of crazy moments, I think Busher and Clarko would be toe to toe. Like Busher had some crazy ones, but they were almost like the legend or the myth of Busher as opposed to actually locker room or game day instructions. Whereas Clarko just had some absolute. Like ballistic moments. Any, any um, you can share. Oh, there's ones that are like well documented, like where he, um, oh, he's, he would, uh, he like got so worked up and so angry, like in a post game meeting, um, like hit himself in the head and like legitimately concussed himself and like stumbled, <laughs> like he was just like so worked up. Um, <laughs> and, like, um, but then he would like he would he would feed off that fear as well. Like he'd walk in if we played a bad game, and um, like say I just walk straight in the bed, closed and goes, "Boys, I hope you're wearing your helmets because I'm throwing grenades today." And then guys would just like sink in their chairs. And um, but then at the same time, he was very quick to to point out or I'd point out, you know, if someone did the right thing and and push the team ethos. So it's um, I, I don't know if all coaches are like that, and um, Certainly, none of my assistant coaches were really like that. I think the the assistants and the 
and the senior coach often need to compliment each other in terms of what they what they bring to the team because um, you can't all be crazy, I suppose. Do you think you'll um, bring some sort of element of crazy as now moving into that assistant coaching role? Do you have something up your sleeve that you can, um, you know, like a, a throwing grenades line or something to instill fear in the players? Oh, no, nothing that comes to mind. I might, maybe I'll borrow a few from Clarko, but I, that's definitely that's not my style. <laughs> like, it would just, it would not seem authentic. And if there's one thing uh, players can smell, it's uh, it's a bit of bullshit. So, so, so you must be excited about that. Dan's talking about, of course, you've just been appointed as the Western Bulldogs assistant coach in the forward line. Um how, how did that come about? Because you haven't been coaching post footy, and uh, what, what does that mean for you coming into a team that's just played in a grand final under a, clearly a great coach like Luke Luke Beveridge? Yeah, well, um, I've had some dialogue since finishing footy with Bevo. I, he, I was lucky enough; he was uh, one of my assistant coaches whilst I was at the Hawks, and we had a really good working relationship. And um, maybe the nature of of playing or playing under him in a premiership side, like you know. We've certainly kept touch and been, um, you know, relatively close in that respect. And I've always used him as a little bit of a sounding board in terms of across some footy stuff. And then I, um, he was keen for me to potentially do some stuff when I first finished. Uh, but I was really keen to step out of footy for a little bit and experience, you know, what else the world has got to offer. Um, and then effectively, I, I stepped back into footy at a role at Collingwood, actually an, an operations role across, you know, quite a few things, a bit of a, you know, Swiss Army knife of, of roles across welfare, NGA and VFL over here. And and with that comes certainly some coaching responsibilities when we're a bit short-staffed and probably start to get a bit of an appetite for it um, over the last 12 months. And then uh, just as it turned out, opportunity arrived at the Bulldogs and I had a good chat to Bebo about it and um, sort of talked through what they're looking for in terms of someone... Uh, in terms of probably more around who can work with the, what is a young, really young group other than Josh Bruce really in their forward line. Um, and Ash Hansen, who I was a you know teammate of ours, Scoey was the, the forwards coach there and, you know, big red as well. And, you know, probably is one of the most genuine people to play the game that I've played with. Um, and I think they, not to say that I'm you know, as nice as Ash Hansen, but I think they were looking for a real relationship person who can sort of work with that younger crop as opposed to maybe an old school footy head who was uh, who was looking to bring in some some real tactics or something like in that respect. Um, you, you've... And in terms of coming to a team from the grand final, sorry, I was going to say I'm no, no, actually pretty excited about it. Like it's a to come to a team who's lost the grand final, this you know, and the fact they are so young. I mean, I look at that list and you know you can't help but get excited about something like that. Do you do you think that uh, you, you've been around groups that have lost grand finals as of as of I? Do you think that'll be a big uh, benefit for the group? I mean, I, I look at you going into a young group. I know the sort of person you are, young, uh, you know, a younger coach, relationship guy. Do you think you'll be able to instill some knowledge about what it means to lose a grand final and what that means for the years coming up for this young group? Uh, yes and no. You, when it comes to those sorts of things, you've got to be mindful that it's not your journey as well, right? So it's um, you don't want to necessarily pass on messages to these guys like, you know, back in my day kind of attitude. <laughs> as fun as anecdotes and some stories are, you know, you just, uh, the game does change pretty quickly. And But also, uh, respectfully, they don't give a shit about what, what I felt. And you need to let them learn that. Now, you need to guide them, I suppose, in some degrees and... Um, try and at least get them to recognize there are so many good learnings that can come from, from something like that, which um, my initial introduction to, to this group and some of the players is you know, they, they won't need too much steering. I think they're, they're well led and luckily they've had some success themselves, many of them in 16. So to then lose last year, I think the, like, you don't certainly have to instill hunger. That's, that's for sure. But you're right, Scott, there will be little things along the way, but in terms of I'm not going to come in there with a mantra of, uh, you know, this is what you need to do, this is the formula, because it just doesn't ring true for every group. Happens a lot um, in sports, you know, not, not just footy, but players who play for a while and sort of, you know, they become a coach and they say, you know, pretty much always knew I was going to become a coach at some point. Was that ever a thing for you or, or was it 
you know, later on in your footy career that you thought, oh, I might want to hang around and do some coaching? Yeah, well, certainly I wasn't one that was, um, you know, whilst I was playing was like, I want to be a coach or anything like that. That wasn't, um, wasn't the attitude. What I did know is that I wanted to be involved in footy though. Um, despite the many, uh, you know, the many setbacks and challenges that I had, I fundamentally loved my career and got some really great moments about it. And, um, and as a result, I wanted to stay involved in the game if I could. So uh, for me, uh, the opportunity to do that now in a, in a coaching format was, well, first and foremost, the challenge I was excited about, as I mentioned before, but one that, you know, I feel that my journey, I can, you, know, you can add some, you can add some value. And uh, I like to think as well, the fact that I was able to hang around for in the game for so long without much output meant that my, my footy acumen was actually reasonable when I was out on the park. But um, so it meant that, you know, picking up the game, I actually find it fascinating. I'm interested in those, those nuances of coaching, but in terms of, you know, when I was 25 or whatever, I was like, yeah, this is the pathway. No, it really wasn't. I took a roundabout way to get, to get here in honesty. Right. I want to take you to Hawthorne. Um, You failed at West coast to win a flag. You didn't have great opportunity because of injury. You failed at Sydney. You had a chance. You, you played some finals, but then injury crueled you again. Come third club, you must be thinking, uh, I kind of know what you're thinking, but you must be thinking, am I going to get my opportunity to win a premiership? Um, 2014. You win it 14 or 13? Sorry, I should know that. No, I won 14. So, yeah, missed <laughs> yeah, another so, one in 13. Before so, then as well. so you missed another in 13. You must be... At that stage of your career, thinking I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get a chance to win one, is is that how you're feeling? Uh, you know me better than that, Scully. No, I never <laughs> thought that. I um, look, I uh, I don't get me wrong. I would have loved to have to have been. I suppose each one of them was was so different in terms of missing, if that makes sense. To so it wasn't as if you didn't bundle them up as like three missed ones as I alluded to earlier, like the, the West Coast one, I was absolutely just a passenger and it was almost just a privilege to have a, like a front row seat to that. Um, the Sydney one, of all of them, maybe that one and 15 probably hurt the most because uh, there was just my body that failed me, honestly. I, I truly believe that if I was fit enough, I, I would have played in probably both those games. Um but uh, particularly the 12 one because I just I didn't play a single AFL game in 2012 and just couldn't I couldn't get going just kept tearing my hamstring so that one really hurt that was that was that was tough to miss out on and rightly or wrongly the way Sydney um, went about it post game it was a little bit more excluded rather than like a full squad mentality it was it was about the well then 23 players so it was um so that was tough. And then 2013, very different. I, as I sort of mentioned before, I, I came to Hawthorne probably knowing what my role in the in the organisation was, and I actually played round 20, 23 and and the first final for Hawthorne as a forward, and played played all right, but I only played the first final because um because <laughs> Bud was but, suspended. But, Buddy was out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You played well and, in that um, first final. I remember messaging you. Yeah, it was. It was like, put it this way. It was. Like, it wasn't like an eight goal haul or anything, but it was. It was okay. And um, and Simo, who was my line coach then as a forward at the time, Adam Simpson. Um, yeah, uh, it was great. Like sat me down on on uh, Monday morning. You do your tapes, and he's like, "Spang, first and foremost, well done on the weekend." You're not playing this week. Bud's back. Like that was that, that was it. And then you could, like, which like, of course, I'm not going to take Buddy Franklin's spot in the side. So, but it's, I think Simo and I had the relationship where he could be that honest with me, and I was probably at a point in my career where I could have that that feedback. Um, plus, Hawthorne at the time, their their VFL affiliate Box Hill was going really well, and we were actually. You know, we had our own finals campaign going at that time anyway. So, like, there was still plenty to play for. Um, and so, for me, 2013, I felt I felt I was in a for that grand final. I felt like I was where I was placed. I didn't feel hard done by. 
I, that team, that is exactly where I should have sat in terms of selection, and I was comfortable with that. So, and plus, we were able. Sorry, yeah. I was going to say we had some success at Boxer. We won the flag that year, the week before the AFL Grand Final. So it wasn't as if you like you had a you had something to hang your hat on for that year. So 2014 comes around. Um, you you're in the team, more solid position. L- leave out that year, but but coming into that Grand Final. Talk, talk to me about the feeling. How did you feel grand final day? What what, what did it feel like? Um, did you feel relaxed? Did you feel like your whole career was on the line? Were you just focused, role, role position? Where, where was your mind at coming into it and, and the week leading up to it? Yeah, certainly. Well, my preliminary final was pretty ordinary. I didn't play that well. Um, and, and again, probably to the point of the, the relationship that I had with some of the coaches at that stage in my career, but like Clarko pulled me up on that pretty quickly um, to say like, you know, I was, I was wound up pretty tight and like I played, I looked like I played tense. Um, but to his credit, he basically called me, I think it was either Monday, I think it was Monday night um, and just told me that I was playing. He's like, Spang, relax, you're playing this week, enjoy the week, like wrap your head around it, um, which was... At the time, I probably didn't appreciate how much I needed that early uh, reassurement of my position in the team, but it certainly allowed me to soak up everything that that week has to offer. And it's it is a unique week, um, although I got to you know I effectively got to live it as you know training with the previous three teams that played in the grand final that I was part of. Like it's a it's different when you know you're part of the twenty two and. Um, and for me, that was that was great. Um, and then it is, a, I mean, you've done it, Scully. Like it's all the the hoopla with the parade and stuff like that. It's um, like it's it's crazy to think, but it's not normal. So I think you need to wrap your head around that it's not a normal week. And um, and then the day itself was uh, like I really enjoyed it. I, it's quite like I, I still have vivid memories of of how it was all going. Like I. I'd had some car troubles a couple of weeks earlier, so I was I was borrowing. I borrowed my my nonna's car, which was like a <laughs> no, like a '96 like Corolla or something. Oh, that's <laughs> that good to, to roll up to the granny and and Hodgy was behind me, and he was like, "What the fuck is in that car?" <laughs> um, so um, some nana has lost so her thanks, spot. Thanks. Doesn't know where she is. Yeah, so fortunately she didn't need it that much, too much that week. Um, How'd you play? But uh, like, and then, uh, look, I think okay. I didn't, uh, I didn't star, but you know, I think holistically the whole team played pretty well that day. Um, I haven't watched it back too many times. I've only watched it what back once, but we, um, we certainly we played well. Like the the first half was was really good. And then the second half was, um, well, it's probably by three quarter time. We'd, we'd, I'd certainly had confidence that we'd won it. But, um, but as a backline unit as well, we did really well that day. Other than Bud kicking four, but to show like, the prowess of, a, of, I think you know, roughly a sixty point loss, he was still able to kick four goals. Like he was peak of his powers, almost sort of around that that era, and um, and he was unreal. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was a, it was a good unit. You good unit, I so, suppose that game. So I've got a little story to share here, Dan. Um, so, uh, so Matt and I, Matt was drafted twelve months b- before I was to West Coast. We're both key position players, both from uh, private school families in Victoria. Got both loving families. We connected pretty early on in our time at West Coast. Uh, the, the first reason was um, uh, the first training session. Shannon Hearn picked me up for training, and. Uh, and I was like, who is this old guy driving me to training? <laughs> and I remember Art, like, sort of, I didn't know who he was. And I was sort of, like, asking him, being nicely, you know, how long you been at the club? Uh, you know, it must be good having some good relationships over here. And he, he was Spang's age. Like, he was not, he was he was 18. <laughs> he was 18 turning 19. He's actually, he's, he's, younger, he's younger than me. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was 25. Anyway, yeah. so he gave me my first lift to training. And I was like, look, I can't have this, like, middle-aged player driving me to training. <laughs> uh, I want, like, someone younger. I want to, like, you know, so, so Spang lived around the corner. And Spang actually drove me to my second session. He reached out and said, oh, take me along. Anyway, I'm just giving some 
context. We moved out together, lived together for a couple of years in Scarborough, um, spent our formative years together, right? Matt went on and, uh, you know, starred for Sydney and starred for Hawthorne. Followed his career, we were, uh, you know, groomsmen at each other's wedding. Um, Matt gave me the honour of speaking at his. I did not give him the honour of speaking at mine, but I didn't <laughs> give anyone else the honour, so he missed out. Bad luck, Spain. But in 2014, I'd known his whole career. I'd known his trials, tribulation, his injuries, everything that had happened. And I didn't have a ticket to the grand final. And and I thought, uh, Hawthorne would be the best team all year. And I just, uh, I had a feeling they were going to win. Spain was in it. And I just thought, like, I got, I have to get there. Yep. Don't know how I'm going to get tickets. Anyway, the week b- before the grand final, I'm still not going to the grand final. I don't have flights, nothing. Anyway, a text message comes out through the club and it says, uh, does anyone want to do the grand final sprint? Yes. And I was like, no, not really. <laughs> and it said, uh, you get uh, two flights for you and a partner and two tickets as the payment. Yes, please. That's me. <laughs> So 2014, I did the grand final sprint, right? And uh, I didn't want to be stuffing around halfway through the game, trying to get into the final. And, and ha- so that's what happens. They do heats before the game, then they do the final, the final eight in the middle of the game. I was like, well, I'm not having none of that. I just want to be here for the tickets. I want to get blind. I want to enjoy watching my best mate play in a grand final and win it. Um, so the heat, it was, between, um, <laughs> it was between eight of us. And the top four went to the final. There was only there was only um, three guys that wanted to actually make the final. Five of us didn't want to make the final. <laughs> so, and, and we're all chatting beforehand. And I'm like, look, I'm telling you, fellas, if I have to walk, if I have to lie down and crawl, I'm not making the final. So we we come out of the, this is the heat. Ready, set, go. Gun goes. We come out. Three guys go piss bolting off. There's five of us effectively walking down the straight. It was an absolute embarrassing debacle of a sprint. Like there's chari- money to charity for this stuff. There's five of us. No one wants to take that fourth position to make the final. <laughs> and I ended up literally stopping in the heat. I just said, I'm not going to, boys, you just, someone's going to have to go here. I'm not making the final. I'm telling you right now. I can't remember who it was. Someone took the bait, made the final. I got to watch in the stands, my best mate win a grand final. And in that year, Spain, um, that's my story. But that year, you became this, uh, well, it was a cult figure. You, you, mm. you, you, you garnered cult figure status, um, not only in Melbourne, but across Australia as, oh, some people called you Jesus. We'll say that. This is not a religious term. This is just your long flowing locks no. and your you know, unshaven Can beard. I just give you a quote? Yeah, please. Um, this is from your mate, John Ralph. Ralphie. Uh, he said in the sun, let's face it, when you look at half when you look at him half rock god and half Jesus, men want to be you and women want to be with you. Half <laughs> rock god, half Jesus. So that's what you became in twenty fourteen. How did how did that come about? How did that feel? And tell me about it, please. Uh, yeah. It, um don't be shy. Well, firstly, thanks for your anecdote about the uh, the anecdote about the grand final sprint. I I forgot to mention that I did enjoy your presence. <laughs> Couldn't you be just uh, like you know do the thing where you pull up with a hammy result. or something? Yeah, there was but there was five of us that wanted to do that. <laughs> so that was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did well. You did well. I did appreciate that. And before answering your other question about um, rock the god Jesus and stuff, rock I uh, my my one uh, I do have one regret, Scoey, that I wasn't able to get back from the UK to get back for your grand final. No, no, return no, 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 we're coming. We'll come to that next. I got a question about it. <laughs> um, but uh, to go back to the original thing, it actually sort of started the year before and it was probably more reflection on the Box Hill fans. Um, you know, similar to the Waffle Clubs, like you've got some, the old state league clubs over here, that like the, the, not just the standalone BFL teams have got um, some really like, you know, ingrained diehard fans from yesteryear that sort of still get involved. And so a few of them who are now still adopting the Hawks as well. At Box Hill, there's a few of them and they really, really got around yeah. the look. Yeah. Um, which it's funny because nowadays, like, you know, every single, almost everyone's got long hair and a beard and stuff. But I feel like Scully, like back then, there weren't too many of us doing that. I feel like it was, um, at least initially, it wasn't like a common thing. And then... Uh, and yeah, and I think um, maybe combined with 
all the stuff was discussed in terms of uh, a footy journey that wasn't smooth. And then my style of footy, as you know, Scoey, wasn't uh, wasn't graceful. So um, all those things, I think, combined to really uh, and the rise of Instagram maybe helped. So like it was a uh, it was a crazy time, and I it was pretty funny like to to live that. Um, did you have any? But, uh, I certainly. Did you have any stories? Like any, 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 what like any jumping lines. Oh, there was some. There was like, I, I, I flattering, but like there was a fan that got like, my name tattooed on her arm and stuff like that. So that was pretty <laughs> intense. Um, <laughs> which, um, which and like. You know what they're like, the fans. Like, I don't know, actually. I can't. Actually, well, I was like at the Eagles, it was always closed off, but at the Hawks, it was like a public venue, so like, people would just be there. And um, I once had, there's, a, I think it might be on my Instagram. There's a photo of someone made a, effectively like a Muppet, like a, a like a puppet, like <laughs> of me, and I like, brought it to training. Voodoo doll. That was probably the other craziest thing that happened. That was unbelievably complimentary. To, but also, you know, like, terrifying. Well, like, yeah, well, to to put this in context, Dan, um, there was a there was like a nationwide drinking game for the grand final, where any touch Matt Spanger got in the grand final, right, you had to scream Spanger and scull your drink. <laughs> right, so it wasn't a dangerous drinking game because I think you got 15, 15 or sixteen touches. Well. Double digits was something Spain didn't do very often in his career, so it was it was often you know, quite a mild drinking game. But, no. uh, but, but trust me, I can say that because I was the same. But the grand final, there was literally half a bay of people that Alex and I were sitting in, screaming "Spanger" every time he touched it and sculling drinks, oh and he had sixteen. So everyone in this bay was absolutely shit faced <laughs> and screaming "Spanger" <laughs> for the whole grand final. It was unreal. Did you um? Yeah. Do you have time? It was um. It was nice. It was nice to be received that way. Sorry, sorry, Dan. No, no, no. It's just uh, before um before we chatted, I was having a look um at the sir Matthew Spanger Facebook page and some of the posts. Do you have, do you ever take a look at that? It's like a fan page. I didn't know if it was you behind uh, it or not. <laughs> no, no, it's not my creation. I did um. I did actually meet the person one one evening out who who created that, and it was just like a, you know, like a nineteen year old kid at the time, <laughs> um, which is probably typical of my of my fan base is normally like adolescent, like or like early adulthood private school boys from Melbourne who just like <laughs> love getting around me and like hit me up at stakes day at the races or 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 like elderly women. So like, who uh, seems to be like the primary like fan base, which is still very nice, but that seems to be the demographic that gravitate towards the that era of football. It does have um thirteen thousand people that like the page. The last post was this from from twenty uh, third of June twenty seventeen. It says Ryan Burton is the next me, and that's the last we've seen on on the um Sir Matthew Spanger page. I. Uh... Hey, look, I loved Bert. I got to play with Bert for a year, and I, um, I think he, I think he was a really, he's a good kid, and well, he's not a kid anymore. But uh, I would have been more than happy to pass the baton to someone like that if <laughs> I, that was the case. I just remembered a story that I was meaning to touch on earlier on in your career. Now, um, a lot of your friends and 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 friends of mine are, are Melbourne Demons supporters, so it must have been a big year for for yeah, them to for, for them to win the grand final. Correct. You, you, that, that must have been a great yeah, year. Yeah. I know where you're going with this, by the way, and yeah. <laughs> so, talk to me about early on in your career. About look, we're not gonna we're not gonna name who this is, but talk to me about Demon Dave. <laughs> yeah. T- um, tell me what happened there. Well, Demon Dave is a online name or hook or whatever for like a for like a good friend of of mine. Who just an avid, avid D's fan and would hit the blogs and things like that. Fan footy, big fan footy. Anyway, fan. yeah, yeah, huge fan. So he's had a big, he's had a big year, Demon Dave. Um, he's still but, on fan um, footy, guarantee. He's still on. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, 
And it's a really, like, honestly, it was a good lesson for me to learn early. And fortunately, it didn't cost too much other than just a significant load of embarrassment, I think, for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I effectively, uh, I... I remember I went to uh, I went to like a, as you do you sit in the team meeting or whatever and then as I was leaving the team meeting like we were playing Melbourne this is in 06, we were playing Melbourne uh, that week and uh, I my my mate Demon Dave rings me and answered the phone call because why wouldn't I and he's uh, just talking chit chat he's like you got the days this week like anything you can tell me like I was like no nah, mate like I'm not not like, I didn't have any information anyway like not that I was in any of the like the the deeper meetings other than team selection and um. And I just a throwaway line, like off the back of him, just pressing. Was like, oh, I think like you know, like Matty Rosa might be running with Travis Johnson or something. Like, might be the only like significant thing that I mentioned. And um, anyway, and then he naively like posted that on a forum that one of the other deep footy fans then uh, backtracked and realised that the person who'd posted that had reference that they were friends with me from you know eight months earlier when I'd been drafted or whatever. And connected the dots and then it became like a full news story that you know player leaks information and stuff like that must have been a slow news week clearly oh man um, but but i'd actually got on a flight that friday night to come back to melbourne because i was injured and it was like been given a weekend back in melbourne and so like i woke up on a sunday morning after like going out with some mates probably with demon dave to like an article on the back page of the paper and like calls from the you know the pdm the Eagles at the time, like, and I was like, oh my God, like, what, what is this? And it was just way bigger than what it was. And in the end, I don't even think Rose actually was running with him. I actually think the information was wrong or like, it was only like, it was only like at, like at one battery throw in or something so stupid. But well, like the premise of it. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say, well, like, for me though, like as a young player and like, it was just really like, be mindful of who you, release information to and in my role this year at well that i just had at the pie certainly in that that pdm space and as a you know figure dealing a lot with the younger players i often use that story as a as a way to like to just be careful on on what information you do reveal because you just don't know to what degree someone would release it and i I still am good friends with the demon dave and trust him with my life so it's not as if it was like a um was as if it was just like a stupid thing that just that turned out to be bigger than what it was, which is, and as Scully brings it up, because we absolutely still take the piss out of Demon Dave for all this <laughs> regularly. Um, so amongst our friendship group, it's a, it is a thing. And he felt worse than anyone about it as well. So, um, which, you know, that's all, but it's, it was just a lesson we both learned. Um, and the last one on the grand final, Dan, I know you want to get to social media and I certainly do. Um, <laughs> two two things. I've got to be one of the only opposition players to be in the premiership rooms for when someone won it. So after winning, uh, losing the grand final heat sprints uh, and Spang won and I'd been yelling Spanger and Scully my beers, I thought, <laughs> well, I'm here now. I'm getting into the rooms. So I literally just acted like I was someone and walked into the Hawthorne rooms and I was in the rooms with Spang having a beer with his premiership medal. So that was a proud moment in my life. Fast forward to 2018. Uh, Matt was living in London. And at some stage, you were weighing up on coming back, weren't you, for that game? Yeah, honestly, like I, I really wanted to. I um, I, I could, probably could have got out of any other work commitment other than this one thing I had, that's like the, effectively the morning of the AFL grand final. I just couldn't do it. I just started a new job. And I, I Ironically, I ended up quitting that job about two months two months later. So I should have just not gone. But so um, so I'm walking around. I've won the premiership, got the medal, and my whole thing was I wanted to be slow. So I was right at the back of everyone. I was taking my time. I sculled a couple of beers around doing a lap. Actually, <laughs> anyway, I bumped into Matt's wife and her partner, and uh, sorry, Matt's sister and her and her partner, and uh, she was yelling at me and. And I knew exactly who she were, and she's screaming and carrying on and cuddling me and chucking this phone in my face. I'm like, Ch- chill out, mate. Like, I know it's great. <laughs> anyway, Spang was on FaceTime. Oh, so period. Spang was on FaceTime on the boundary, took him out into the middle of the ground. We had a bit of a chat. Can't remember what I said to you. 
but at least you made it. Oh, uh, no, nothing of nothing of decent substance. It was more just enjoying the moment, mate. I was uh, you were just too busy screaming as you should have been, <laughs> and um, but it was awesome, mate. Like I, I, oh, mate, honestly, I like I got up. You know, you get up at six a.m. and watch it on UK Time Live, and um, the fact that that game, even if I was remotely neutral, you would have been pleased getting up for that. But the way it all panned out, given our friendship, I was uh, I was very, very, very happy and over the moon, and the fact that I've was able to just to have the stars aligned where my like, yeah, you're right, my sister snuck down the front and managed to shove a phone in your face that I actually got <laughs> to be there in some capacity was really nice. Um, all right. It's time for social media. We put this out pretty late. We've uh, we've pulled this pod together um, at the last minute a little bit. You've always been on my list, but we appreciate the time you've given us. Just a little bit more time to give the people what they want. So social media, as you know, Spang, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, people write questions, you answer them. That's it. So uh, here we go. Yeah, fair enough. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to read the names and the and the questions because okay, I've got it all in front of me. Uh, McGill Grant says, "Loved him running from the back line at the coasters. Sorry to see him go, but stoked to see him win one at the Hawks." My question: Who was the most annoying pest of a teammate you ever had? Uh, actually, one that we both probably played with Scully at different times. Like Louis Jetta comes to mind. Oh wow. Um, <laughs> He was uh, – maybe I got him when he was a bit younger. He was a serial pest at the Swans. Um, Great. But in a fun way, as you know. As you know, Jets is a very entertaining man. Yes. Um, that one certainly comes to mind. Um, Sam Mitchell. Players that were annoying. Like, Sam Mitchell. Yeah, like – yeah. But he was probably more annoying to opposition than to me. Yeah. Um, Tomo, James Thompson, <laughs> the name that many people would know, but he was annoying. <laughs> So yeah, those those three probably yeah. Um, go, go for go for gold, Dan. Go for gold. Let's go. Um, uh, this is the way that social media used to be done with no preparation <laughs> and reading the I questions. Gonna, I was going to say, but well, this looks well thought out. Yeah, yeah. There's just so many here; it's hard to get through them all. Uh, Stefan underscore one zero three nine. Great uh, username there. Uh, what was it like going from fringe player to dead set cult hero? Yeah, I suppose like we touched on it a little bit. Like it was, um, oh, it was unexpected. Is probably the if I did one one word, but it was honestly, it was, it was, it was fun. Like it was a fun moment in my life um, because footy was going well. Like you know, people getting around you. Know, it's hard not to to enjoy those moments. But I suppose I wasn't. I was painfully aware that it might not have been like it was a little bit in jest as well. You know, I wasn't. It wasn't because I was the equivalent of Bud or anything like that, as we sort of alluded to. It was um, maybe more for my appearance than my footy prowess, so you, you can't take it too seriously. You want me to read you a username, Dan? And yeah, I'll go for it. In the right direction. I think Matt cut back underscore. I think that's yeah. got something in it. On the subject of players having too much power in trades, uh, do you reckon a big part of the differences between the AFL and, say, the NBA or Premier League is the pay scale? Seems like a bit more. Uh, seems a bit more harsh to ask a guy on a one hundred and fifty to two hundred k salary to move across the country without any say in it. Uh, pay me eight million a year, and I'll move anywhere you like. So, yeah, context. Yeah, we, we, last last week when we spoke with Andrew Bogut about um, player movement in the AFL and contracts not really being worth much at the moment because you can nominate a club that you'd like to go to, and you basically handcuff the team into force into sending you there. Um, so do you think a part of that then is the amount of money that the players are making compared to these leagues where you get traded at the drop of a hat and you don't really have a say where you go? Yeah, I didn't hear that, but I, that's a very interesting point. And certainly, I mean, in terms of people who are in a position to comment on that, Andrew Bogart comes is certainly probably the, one of the better ones to do that. Um, I think there'd be elements to that. I think um, like the nature of it as well, is like in terms of trades and things like that, the, the clubs are, um, well, I, I found that uh, they do they do the business where the club, like the, you got to remember the club will always be at the forefront and then they're not privately owned. So it's about, it's about performance rather than money. Like, so selling a player in the NBA or something like that, um, even if you got nothing back from performance, it's money in the bank that you can spend on whatever you choose to. Uh, whereas the AFL is more aligned to a cap that 
um, and those trades are governed by that system. So it's a, it's a, it's not a, an apples for apples comparison, I think. Well, talking about trades, um, how do they all work for you? Because you were you weren't traded every time. Is that correct? How, how did your movement between your clubs go? West Coast to Sydney, Sydney and Hawthorne? Yeah, delisted by West Coast and drafted by Swans, redrafted. Yeah. Um, and then traded from Sydney to Hawthorne. What did they trade so, you for? I can't imagine a lot. I actually don't <laughs> even know the pick. A um, <laughs> couple of bags of quirky jacket. <laughs> it'd, be, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be worth looking up because um, Sydney wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have had to pick up much to win that trade, I reckon. Um, usually we have our uh, our main man Charlie behind the um, behind the buttons, and I'd throw that to Charlie. But Charlie is away, as our listeners know. So um, I'm going to have Dan look it up while we just kind of round this all out, mate. Um, playing playing in in I mean I, I, I reflect on your career and look at it as if you you've played with potentially the three eras over the last close to double decade, right? You've got West Coast, the powerhouse West Coast was. You've got the Bloods in the middle there, and then you've got the three Pete Hawks. You probably just missed out on Richmond. Um, you might have just had to go a couple more years, and then you could have got involved in the Richmond powerhouse. But what do you what do you, what do do you you think about looking back on your career? Do you feel fulfilled? Do you feel, um, you know, or do you feel like you had more to give? Where does it all spit out in the end? Um, I, th- oh, I think certainly where I sit now, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with how it all played out. If I'm being honest, if I wasn't lucky enough to play in 2014 and I missed out on, on all five, that might've been tougher to swallow and to say about your career. But I'm well aware that all well, for me, playing, being part of a premiership side was, was all I wanted to do. So to not have all the other accolades in terms of high games played and individual awards and stuff, it didn't bother me. So um, to be part of the, of at least one side on game day like, was important in many ways, provided vindication, I think, for for what the I suppose the body of work you put in, not just for the 11 years, but all that comes before it. So, um, and in many ways, it's bigger than you. Like, you know, it's going my family well and... Um, I'll get meant a lot to them as well. And then, so as a result, that then reflects back onto you. So it's, um, I certainly look back now and think it's, it's fantastic. And I, I, and certainly what I'm doing now and even what I've done in the last 12 or to be honest, even what I've done since finishing footy, um, that journey has provided me to have a much different outlook on, on the way I've gone about tasks in my, you know, professional life since then. So, and for the most part, that that attitude has been well received. So, I think, um, so I think that's what I think. I look back and think it was all part of like where I'm supposed to be without getting too philosophical. But I honestly, I loved it. And then, uh, other than the on-field stuff, mate, but the the capacity to play at three different teams, where you know you've now got friends all over the country and like to make room, locker room mates and and you know staff and stuff like that it was. Was a was a I suppose a, a another benefit that I you didn't really foresee when you're bouncing around and like I grew up you know wanting to be a one club player like all that sort of old school stuff and that quickly changes when those things are taken away from you um, without your choice and at the moment I think that mentality is completely shifted anyway I think um, maybe not completely at club land but certainly amongst the players. Um, yeah, I agree. And I, I really enjoyed that 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 benefit. So, um, and I feel thankful for that. So you were traded for pick number sixty four, oh. and that then was resulted in Matthew Dick, <laughs> is who Sydney picked up. Matthew Dick didn't end up playing for. How did Matty S- Dick go? He didn't play for Sydney, but he played uh, six games for Carlton, and that's it. Well, you got traded for a dick, mate. So congratulations, yeah. buddy. <laughs> Wow, a, that's the best thing I've ever. Heard. What a beautiful summation of my. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Oh, really mate. Humor. Oh, really, really mate. It out. All right, so that's all we got time for. Matt Spanger, a great career, great footy story. Uh, West Coast Hawthorne, uh, Sydney Hawthorne. 
somewhere in the middle traded for a dick and um, and, a, and a premiership medal, mate. So thank you for your time. I couldn't have ended it any better if I tried. <laughs> and um, all the best for next year at the Bulldogs, which I'm looking forward to see how you go, mate. Make sure you keep Norts and Brucey and the boys. Make sure those hair, that, that those locks are flowing. I know that'll be a big part of your role next year. Yeah, that's pretty much what they brought me in for to make sure that was up, up to speed. Very good, mate. Well done. No, thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys, for having me. It's been nice.